remember the first time that I realized I was going to need glasses. It was a scary moment. I uh, love to read. I've loved to read my whole life. And I'm really in my happiest place when I've got a few hours to sit with a good book and read. One night a few years ago, I lay down in bed with a good book at the end of the day, so excited to open up the book and have some time to read, and my eyes were hurting. I could tell that I was straining to read the words on the page, and after only a few minutes, I had to put the book down, close my eyes, and go to sleep, and I thought, something is not right. My eyes are broken. So I went to see Dr. Fell, my eye doctor. I told him what was happening, and he was very matter of fact, you're getting older. (laughs) And I was like, I do not receive that. (laughs) He said, you need reading glasses. And I said, Dr. Fell, my kids already don't think I'm cool. This is definitely going to push me over the edge. But I got the reading glasses and something amazing happened. I could see. And I enjoyed reading again. And my eye fatigue went away. I didn't realize how badly I was straining my eyes to read. And how much the ability to see clearly was important to every detail of my daily life. Last Sunday, we started a new series, as Michael mentioned, called The New Birth. And when we opened to our first passage last week in John 3, where Jesus taught about being born again, we heard him say to us, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Something changes in the way we see when we are converted to Christ. It's like we were kind of seeing before, but things were blurry. They were hard for us to discern. And it's like when we come to faith in Christ and and we're born again, it's like somebody puts glasses on our eyes, gives us new lenses to see, new lenses to see God, new lenses to see ourselves, and new lenses to see others. The Apostle Paul picks up this theme in his letters using a phrase to describe our new identity as Christians. He says we are, quote, in Christ. Meaning that when we put our faith in Christ to save us, everything about us changes, not just our eternal destination, not just we are going to heaven instead of hell, but now we are in Christ. We're not just praying a prayer, singing a couple of songs on Sunday, and then going through the rest of our week like nothing has changed. What he's describing when we become in Christ is that we are transformed in our very sense of identity, who we are. And I would submit to you that the first thing that changes when your identity is found in Christ is your sight. That we don't see like we used to see. Not that we're seeing in the sense that we weren't seeing anything in the past. But in the sense that we're seeing the same things, listen to me, in a new way. Becoming a Christian is like putting on new lenses through which you see everything. It's not that the stuff that you're seeing is new. It's how you're seeing it that changes. This metaphor reminds us that we don't just need moral improvement. This whole series on the new birth is about the fact that we need transformation. Last week we said, before Christ we are dead. The Bible says we're dead. 
Ephesians 2. And we need new life. Now listen, that is not saying we're pretty good people and we just need to be better people. It's saying we're dead people and we need new life. The other image in the New Testament is blindness. That we're spiritually blind and we need to be given sight. So Jesus keeps healing physically blind people and then using that to teach on top of, to say to all those who are around him, you might be seeing physically, but what I'm showing you is that what I'm doing to this blind man is what I do to everybody spiritually. I help them to see in a way they haven't seen before. The point is this. Without the renewing work of the Spirit in our hearts, we are dead people, we're not alive, and we're blind people, and we can't see. Without Christ, we can't see what is true, what is good, and what is eternal. And that is another reason, friends, that we have to be born again. So what changes in our vision whenever we experience the new birth? Will you stand with me as we read our passage today? We're going to read God's word together. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21. Thanks for standing in honor of God's word. Here's what scripture says to us today. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Holy Spirit, would you come now and help us to understand it and apply it to our hearts and our lives in practical ways today. We need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. I really want to share with you um, two main ways in which I believe the new birth gives us new vision from this text today. I believe that the new birth gives us new vision of Christ and new vision of ourselves. New vision of Christ and new vision of ourselves. So I want to share that with you this morning and then at the end kind of say, so what do we do with that? Notice the big idea in verse 16. Paul writes and he says, we do not know anyone any longer, and here's the phrase in, the, in our translation, CSB, is from a worldly perspective. Now that phrase worldly perspective in the original Greek is two words, kata sarka. Kata just means according to, and sarka is the word for the flesh. It simply means in the original Greek, according to the flesh. So the CSB translators translate it from a worldly perspective. It's a good translation, but I just wanted you to see the words underneath that translation to understand what Paul's getting at. What he's saying is, we don't see anything any longer just through the lens of the flesh. That's what he's saying. He's saying now that we're in Christ, we see with spiritual eyes. 
we have an eternal perspective. This is so profound that I failed to really be able to communicate to you guys how important this is. Because we go through every day of our lives surrounded by a worldly perspective. We go through every day of our lives in a world that is pushing us to focus on the temporary, to focus on the here and now, to focus on what we can see with our physical eyes, touch with our hands and experience in our bodies, and to only be able to see what is temporary. But here's what the scripture is saying to us. There is more to life than the physical world. There is more to life than what I can get in the short term. As Jesus would say in his teachings, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Why would Jesus ask that question? Because Jesus is seeing something beyond what we are seeing. And haven't you seen this truth again and again and again in your life? People who gain all that this world has to offer only to lose what is most important in the long run. To lose their family, to lose their health, to lose their joy, to lose their relationship with God. Jesus invites us to experience the new birth by the Spirit and to see with eternal eyes. Now listen, this is not some weird, mystical, spiritual, follow your emotions kind of thing I'm talking about. It is an encouragement to see beyond what is right in front of you. To look beyond how much money is in your bank account today. To look beyond how your job performance is going this week. To look beyond what is right in front of you and to see what is eternally important. To see what is eternally true. To see what is ultimately real. So according to today's text, what do we need help seeing? The first is, I think, we have to have help to see Christ correctly. That what Paul is saying to us is we need the new birth to help us see Jesus. Notice in the text in verse 16, he says, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, again, the phrase is according to the flesh, yet we now no longer know him in this way. So the first thing that I believe Paul wants us to see is one of the things that changes in our vision is our vision of Christ. Who is he? Now this is so important because I believe there is a worldly perspective on Jesus. And that's what he's saying. He's saying we used to know Christ according to the flesh. Now this really confused me when I became a new Christian in high school. Because every year around Easter and Christmas... There would be lots of talk about Jesus in the culture. I would go to the grocery store, and all of a sudden, all the magazines by the checkout stand would have Jesus on the cover. You know what I'm talking about? Like, nobody talked about Jesus all all year, and all of a sudden, it's Christmas, and it's Easter, and it's like, all of a sudden, every magazine was about Jesus. I'd turn on the television at Easter time. All the documentaries on the History Channel are about Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, And the point I'm trying to make to you is I thought, oh, this is so great. Everybody loves Jesus. And then I read those articles, and I watched those documentaries, and I listened to what was being said. And what I realized was that there is a worldly view of Jesus that has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible. Did you hear what I just said? There is a worldly view of Jesus that has nothing to do with the Bible's view of Jesus. It wasn't until later that I was able to understand the way Paul's describing it here that there's a worldly perspective on Jesus and a kingdom perspective on Jesus. And the Apostle Paul is speaking from firsthand experience, isn't he? He's speaking from his own story that before he became Paul the missionary, he was Saul the Pharisee. And he had heard about Jesus. 
But as he writes in verse 16, he says, I only knew Jesus from a worldly perspective. I knew him according to the flesh. And this view of Jesus, listen to me, has many people's attention even to this day. What is a worldly perspective on Jesus? Three things real quick. Number one, that he is a moral teacher. Many put Many people put Jesus in the camp with other religious teachers throughout the ages. In this way, they summarize Jesus as a teacher of a moral way of life, which, of course, Jesus was a teacher. But the worldly perspective stops there. Many put put Jesus into this camp like he was some kind of ancient version of like TED Talks today. Like he kind of went around and he just gave little moral snippets of wisdom that, you know, you can follow and that would be good. Like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And we can learn if we want to learn from his moral teaching. And in this way, people can appreciate Jesus as a good teacher, but they don't have to obey him. They can appreciate him, but they don't have to worship him. The second way in which we hear a worldly perspective of Jesus is though Jesus is a religious prophet. In this way, people create a category for Jesus that seems honoring. He was a religious prophet. But in creating this category, we also remove the uniqueness of Jesus. There have been many prophets throughout history, right? And so a lot of people put Jesus kind of in the prophet category. Like Jesus goes in the category with Moses with Isaiah, with Buddha, with Muhammad. And so we think of religious prophets as men or women who claim to hear from God and speak on his behalf. And so from a worldly perspective, people consider Jesus as a religious prophet who spoke into the Jewish tradition of his age and confronted its abuses like other prophets throughout the years have done. And so in this way, we can historically place Jesus within the Jewish first century and we can appreciate his ministry And say, really, he's got nothing to say to us today. A third common view of of Jesus from a worldly perspective is that he was a defeated rebel. And honestly, I think this was Paul's view of Jesus before his conversion. He saw Jesus as a rebel, a rebel against the Jewish hierarchy, against the Jewish tradition, and against the Roman government. And that Jesus, because he was teaching things that Judaism didn't teach, and because he was teaching things the Romans didn't approve of, he was crushed by the Roman Empire. Paul believed before he became Paul that the resurrection story was a lie that his defeated followers created. And many people to this day who study the historical Jesus feel the same way. Well, that's, you know, what religious people believe, but what historically really happened was that they created this narrative about Jesus to keep the movement going. And really, Jesus was just a rebel leader who started a movement that had to be crushed by the empire. Even today, many people see Jesus this way. Of course, there are seeds of truth in each one of these perspectives. Jesus is a teacher, he is a prophet. And he did stand against worldly powers. But that's not all that he is. Are you hearing me this morning? That's not all that he is. To see Jesus in this way is to put him into human categories that we get to control. After his conversion, Paul did not see Jesus this way anymore. He says in verse 16, now we no longer know him, talking about Christ, we no longer know him in this way. What's he mean? He says, all the categories I had for Jesus, all the ways that I understood him from a worldly perspective, he says, now I don't see him that way anymore. What changed? Did Jesus change? No. What changed was Paul. He was born again. He had an experience with the living Christ and he was transformed by the Holy Spirit. And what does he say now? He says, now I don't see Jesus the same way anymore. He says, now I see him from a kingdom perspective. What was this lens? The kingdom perspective on Jesus is number one, he's the savior of the world. The Bible consistently presents Jesus as the one and only savior of the world. In other words, he said about himself, I did not come just to teach or to lead, but I came to rescue. I came to rescue. You might say, rescue from what? The answer is to save us from our sins. 
The Bible says that Jesus went to the cross in our place, taking our sin upon himself. Notice the last verse of our passage today. What does it say? God made the one who did not know sin, Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is called the great exchange. He took our sin. We got his righteousness. The point is that the Christian witness is teaching us that Jesus was not just a human teacher or rebel leader, that something supernatural and eternal happened on the cross when Jesus died. Something of eternal significance. Not just this historical leader was crushed by the Roman Empire, but God was doing something. Not just the Romans or the Jewish leadership, but God was doing something. God was reconciling the world to himself on the cross. He was putting all of our sin on Jesus, and Jesus was giving us his righteousness. In this way, friends, Jesus is not a pathway to self-improvement. He's not just a teacher like all the teachers in the world today who give you thoughts about how to be a better person. He is, according to his own testimony, the savior of the world. He is the one who saves you from sin. He saves you from self-destruction. He saves you from self-righteousness. He is the one and only savior. Number two, the Bible says that he is God in the flesh. Notice verse 19. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Paul is saying something so profound here, that on the cross, the eternal creator God was reconciling the world to himself. How is that possible if Jesus is just another human being? It's only possible if Jesus is fully divine, if he is God in the flesh. Friends, listen, the biblical writers are unanimous and consistent in their testimony. They say from page to page of the New Testament, Jesus is not just a prophet or a leader or a teacher. He is God. That, my friends, is a radical claim. The primary tenet of Judaism was that there is one God and there is no God beside him. Saul the Pharisee accused the New Testament Christians of doing what? Committing blasphemy. He believed in his heart of heart they were committing blasphemy. That's why he was so strong in attacking them and so strong in putting them in jail. Because in his mind, as a good Pharisee, for them to be able to go out and say Jesus is God was blasphemy to his Jewish ears. And yet, here is the same Paul writing That in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That that was God up there on the cross that was reconciling the world. How in the world is this same guy testifying to these truths? Because he had been born again. His whole vision of who Christ was had changed. And he would write in later epistles, the fullness of deity resides in Jesus. He would call Jesus the only wise God. His eyes were open to the truth that Jesus was more than a religious leader. He was and he is the God man, fully God, fully man in one person. And finally, third, when you're born again, you see that Jesus is the resurrected king. The whole faith, according to the apostle Paul, rises or falls on this reality. Did Jesus walk out of the grave on the third day? Let me tell you how important this is to me. Like you, I am often disappointed by the behavior of Christian leaders and the behavior of other Christians. To be honest, I'm often disappointed with myself. And so here's what I want to say to you. The truthfulness of the Christian faith does not rise or fall on the behavior of Christians, but on the reality of the empty tomb. This is not to minimize the importance of our witness. That's very important according to the Bible. We are called to live differently as believers in this world to show people who Jesus is. But the truth of the faith does not rise or fall based on how we behave today. The the truth of the faith rises or falls on the event of the resurrection. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus is alive, all of it's true. If he's not alive, we are to be pitied among all human beings. Because we are following somebody who is dead. 
Now listen. What changed Paul's mind? Because he himself encountered the risen Christ personally. Jesus appeared to him, spoke to him, and commissioned him after his death on the cross. Listen, friends, when we were born again, we see with spiritual eyes that Jesus is not dead, but that he is alive. This is how our view of Jesus changes. Our view of him moves from human categories to divine categories. We begin to understand he's not just another teacher or religious leader, but that he's God, he's the savior of the world, and he's the resurrected king. And as our view of Jesus changes and his identity and his power and what he accomplished, here's what's so powerful. Our identity in him changes. We become different ourselves. We see ourselves and we see other Christians differently. How does this work? Well, friends, the worldly perspective on your life is that your life is defined, first of all, by your past. From a worldly perspective, you are what you did in your past. People continue to bring up who you used to be, how you used to live, because from a worldly perspective, you never really get over your past. In fact, I would say in our world today, this is getting worse, not better. Because what's happening is people are finding digital things people have said, pictures they've posted, videos they've posted from like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, all that goes viral. And then all of a sudden, here you are today trying to defend from something from your past from years and years and years ago. And what does this world want to tell us? You are what you did. You are your past. Does our past impact us? Of course. Does our past define us? No. Second, we want so often to be known from a worldly perspective based on our achievements. From a worldly perspective, we are known by what we do. If we're docked by our past, then we're lifted up by our hard work and our accomplishments. So people are valued based on their degrees, their jobs, their titles, and their wealth. What's weird about all of that is none of it lasts. If you doubt me, read the obituaries on the weekend. One of the things that I do, I know it's weird, but it's just something that's so interesting, is I like to read the obituaries in the Wall Street Journal weekend edition every weekend. They always highlight two or three significant business or world leaders who've died in the last week. And these are all people who've run like billion dollar companies or led like massive nonprofits or they've been like successful you know, government leaders. And 99% of the time, I've never heard of them. That's the first thing that always impresses me. But the second thing that impresses me as I read them is that the obits always end the same way. They died surrounded by their family and friends. Not by the board of directors from the company they led, not from their investment banker, not from the guy you know, that they used to be taken out for a sales meeting. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you? Like at the end of your life, you get clarity about what was important the rest of your life. Achievements fade quickly. It's a false God to say, I am what I have achieved. The third way in which we have a worldly perspective on our identity is our tribe. And I mean this in the broadest sense possibly, possible. Apart from Christ, we're tempted to find our identity from our group, our tribe, maybe our political party, maybe our racial identity, maybe our business peers, or our school friends. This is who I am. We seek who we are through the people around us and what they say about us. And we all know the power of our tribe to shape us and define us. But what Paul is saying is when you become a Christian and your vision of Jesus changes, all these things that used to define who you are, your past, your achievements, your tribe, all of a sudden those things change. This is what he means when he says, the old has passed away and the new has come. What he means is, is I am no longer who I used to be. 
And I do not relate to people the way I used to relate to them. I have moved from death into life, not in some kind of mystical weird way, but in the way I see myself and the way I see the world. All of a sudden, the things that used to be important to me are not important to me anymore. What is the kingdom perspective on your life in Christ? Well, first of all, he says, we are forgiven. Notice the phrase, the old has passed away. The phrase, in Christ, God, listen to this phrase, not counting their trespasses against them. When we are born again, we see for the first time, friends, that we are forgiven. Our past is important, but it is not who we are. It does not define us. Friends, listen to me. The most profound thing that changes in your vision when you become a Christian is that you are set free from believing the lie that you are what you did in your past. I love what Brian Stevenson says when he writes, we are all more than the worst thing we have ever done. That is a gospel perspective. And that is only possible if we are defined by the blood of Christ and not defined by our worst moments and our worst sins. I know if you're here today and you're a Christian, I know you believe that theologically, that you're forgiven. But what I'm saying to you is that you've got to believe that in your heart about this is your identity. I am forgiven. One of the ways in which the old passes away is I do not allow the enemy to whisper in my ear, you'll never amount to anything because of this thing you did. You'll never be useful in the kingdom of God because of this sin in your past. Do you hear what I'm saying? You cannot allow the enemy to whisper that in your ear. You have got to stand on this identity in Christ that says I'm forgiven. And if that's true about who you are, listen to me, how would that change the way you relate to other people? That they are forgiven. Two, we are a new creation. This doesn't mean, as I said last week, that you're perfect when you're born again. But what it means is you have a new heart, a new desire to live for God and not for yourself. What used to define you doesn't define you anymore. Listen to Paul's testimony on this in Philippians 3, 4 through 7. He says, quote, If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. He said, these are all the achievements and the accomplishments that I used to hold up and I had them framed on my wall and this told me who I was. And this is what he says in the next verse. But everything that was a gain to me, I now consider to be a loss because of Christ. That's what it means to be a new creation. To say everything that used to tell me who I was, I now consider worthless because who I am is not based on those things on the wall or those accomplishments or those titles or those things I used to think define me. Now my identity is in Christ. This is what it means to be a new creation. But finally, he tells us from a kingdom perspective, we are ambassadors for Christ because we have been forgiven because we've been made new, now we see ourselves as we have a new purpose in the world. Not to make ourselves great, but to be ambassadors for Jesus. We stop being evangelists for all the things the world has to offer, and we start being evangelists for Christ. I always am amazed by people who say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. And I just say, that's just not true. Everybody in this room is an evangelist. Evangelist just means someone who tells good news. Everybody in here tells good news all the time. You, you guys post good news on your social media every day. Hey, I found gas. It was five cents cheaper. You know, whatever. <laughs> We're all declaring good news all the time. Check out this restaurant. All oh, these new clothes are amazing, whatever. And all I'm saying to you is what changes when you become born again is you now become an evangelist for Christ. You become a proclaimer of good news about who Jesus is and what he has done. You get a higher calling. You get a higher mission. 
So what does God want us to do with this new vision of who Jesus is and who we are in Jesus? First, let me just encourage you, please live out of your identity in Christ. This is a lifelong journey. It has been for me. The truth is, when I was first a pastor, how I felt on Monday morning was directly tied to how many people were at church on Sunday, what the offering was, all these numbers that we look at. And I would be emotionally up or down on Monday, depending on how Sunday went. That is such immature spirituality, but that's where I was as a young pastor, right? What happens is, is as you grow, you should begin to grow and seeing that your identity is in Christ and to live out of that identity. Not how something goes well or bad. We're still impacted by those things, but to say, this is who I am. I had a seminary professor and he used this phrase and I just, I've never forgot it. He said, I don't do what I used to do because I'm not who I used to be. I don't do what I used to do because I'm not who I used to be. So let me ask you this question. Does your Monday morning align with your Sunday confession? Does your view of Christ and who you are shape your Tuesday as much as it does your Sunday morning? This is what it means to live out of our identity in Christ. Friends, make a list of your identity in Christ and ask yourself this question. Am I living as though these things are true? Am I treating people through the lens of what God says about them? Listen to this phrase again. As Paul would write in this passage, from now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Think about how powerful that is. Is that true of you? Two, I would encourage you that if this is true for you, that you would be participating in sharing the Savior. He says, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I shared with you earlier during the announcements that Club Week is a great time to spread the word. Have you invited the kids in your life, in your street, in your circle of influence, in your extended family, because that is a simple way in which we can share the Savior with others. Friends, I'm praying for you as part of this new birth series. I'm praying two things. One, that you would understand a deeper sense of who you are in Christ. And two, that you would be more motivated to share the Savior with those around you. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Father, forgive us where we have found our identity in our past. We have found our identity in our achievements. Father, help us to find our identity every day in Jesus Christ. God, I confess to you that it's a daily battle for me, and I know it is for everybody in this congregation. And so God, today I pray that our vision has been lifted up to Jesus, to know who Jesus really is, and that God, we would live in light of those truths. Father, I want to pray again that you would motivate us as a church family to share the Savior. God, to share who Christ is with the world around us. Father, I pray for every invitation that goes out this week. I pray for every child who's going to come for club week, for every volunteer who's going to serve, for every adult who's going to be on this campus to volunteer and to help. God, we commit all that to you, and we pray, God, that you would spur us on. Even right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would bring names to our minds. Who have we not invited that we need to invite? Help us to see what this passage says, that we are ambassadors for Christ. That's our identity. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the identity we have now in Christ. We pray all this in his powerful name. Amen.